Good day everyone, we are the second set of reporters for the state building in Southeast Asia. We will be reporting three countries. First, the Brunei Darussalam monarchical rule. Second, the Myanmar from Praetorian rule to democratic transition. And lastly, state building of East Timor. Hi everyone, I am Joyce Eloisa Luz Asa Bugaa and I will be reporting about Brunei Darussalam monarchical rule. Brunei, Darussalam, with a land area of 5,765 square kilometers, its capital city Bandar Seri Bigawan, a population of 437,479. Their national language is Malay. Brunei is famous for gorgeous mosques and Islamic architecture. People in Brunei are called Bruanians. Brunei Darussalam is ruled by a monarch. Brunei Darussalam is a small equatorial country on the northern coast of the island of Borneo in Southeast Asia. The South China Sea lies to the north. Otherwise, it is bordered to all sides by the Malaysian state of Sarawak, which divides it into two. The coastal plain rises to the mountains in the east. Nearly three quarters of Brunei's land area is covered by forest. History of Brunei before colonization the Sultan of Brunei, Yang Dipper II Anigar, is a long line of hereditary sultans ruling continuously for 600 years. The present Sultan, Haji Hassan al Bolkeya, is a 29th ruler. Also, Brunei Darussalam is the only ruling monarchy in Southeast Asia. The early Brunei Empire reached its zenith from the 15th to 17th centuries when it exercised sovereignty over much of Borneo and the southern tip of the Philippine archipelago. After the fifth Sultan Bolkea, Brunei was especially powerful and even managed to briefly capture Manila. Colonial Period British Protectorate In 1839, the English adventurer James Brooke arrived in Borneo and gained control over territory in northwest Borneo as a reward for putting down a rebellion in Sarawak. Brooke, who styled himself Raha of Sarawak, soon expanded his territorial control. Soon after, in 1878, on the northeast coast of Borneo, the British North Borneo as a reward company established a foothold and was similarly encroaching on territory tenuously held by the Brunei Sultanate. The arrival of Western powers in the region affected the traditional trading patterns and disseminated the economic base of the Sultanate. Brunei became a British protectorate state in 1888 and had the British not established a residency in 1906. It is very likely that the Brunei would have been absorbed by Sarawak. Brunei was administered by the British under a residency system. The Sultanate did not lose complete sovereignty, especially on matters relating to religion and local custom, but executive authority was held by a succession of British residents, initially aligned with the Sultan to fight regional piracy and the suppressing rebellion. Brooke secured large areas of land to in a number of tranches as payment, eventually assuming control over most of the areas of the heroic sultanate. The white Raha James Brooke carved out increasing sections of the state for his own administration, and he hoped exploitation in the mid-19th century. They succeed entering Brunei Darussalam. Internal self-government was acquired in 1959, and as a result, Executive power was extended to the Sultan. A new constitution was promulgated in 1959 and Brunei assumed full internal sovereignty in 1971. As Britain moved to decolonize, Brunei's status as a protectorate was put in the mix with Sarawak and Sabah as possible state in a new Malaysian federation. Domestic self-rule commenced in 1959 and in 1962, Brunei was formally invited to join in the Federation of Malaysia, which is Sultan Omar Ali Sali Saifuddin III initially supported. When the people of Brunei have known about this invitation, there was popular opposition to the move by the Parai Rakyat Brunei, or Brunei People's Party, or PRD, 
which had won all 16 elected seats in the 33-seat legislature in the 1962 elections. The PRB favored making Brunei a constitutional monarchy which would have significantly limited the power of the Sultan and opposed federation with the Malaysia under the terms offered. The PRB proposed that it should only join in the federation with Malaysia if Brunei could be combined with territories of Sarawak and Sabah. When the Sultan have heard about the PRB's proposal, the Sultan rejected the proposal to amalgate with other northern territories given it would considerably weaken his power and delay the opening of the legislature. In response, the PRB's armed wing, the Tentera Nasional Kalimantan Utara, TNKU, rose in rebellion. The TNKU supported by Sukarno's Indonesia with limited training. Planning for the rebellion was known about in advance and with the government at the commands and other troops with the PRB being outlawed in response to the uprising Sultan decided against joining the Malaysian Federation, in part through fear of the further negative reactions from the people on Brunei, instead remaining independent. On the British advice, in 1962, the Sultan suspended the constitution and declared a state of emergency, ruling under emergency powers renewed every two years until 2004. When the Sultan rejected the offer for the Federation of Malaysia because he was scared of the negative reaction of his people, he then used emergency powers confirmed upon the Sultan the capacity to make any orders whatsoever which he considers desirable in the public interest and to prescribe penalties which he may be imposed for any offense against any such order and to provide for the trial by any court of persons guilty of such offenses. In the late 1950s, the early 1960s, Brunei strongly resisted the British pressure to amalgate with its neighbors, first in the British Borneo Federation and later in the state of Malaysia. So, the Sultan officially rejected these offers because he was scared of the negative reactions of his people. With the option of joining the Malaysian Federation still on offer, the proposition of reduction of monarchical powers under the Malaysian Federation finally decided the Sultan against joining Malaysia. The Sultan chose self-rule under British protection until 1984 when the colony achieved full independence. So, by this time, the Sultan has finally rejected the idea to be part of the Malaysian Federation. But they asked for protection until 1984 when they have received the independence. The British Army continues to retain a light infantry Gurkha Battalion in Brunei as a Praetorian Guard to protect the Sultan and his family. The Royal Brunei Armed Forces also compromises for battalions which are employed both of the defensive forces and to assist the Royal Brunei Police in maintaining law and order. These British have been protecting the royal family because they were scared that the people of Brunei may also attack the royal family. In 1979, Brunei and the British signed a new treaty transferring powers over defense and foreign affairs to Brunei and this waived the full independence in 1984. By this time, Brunei has finally received its full independence against the British. Brunei would have struggled to continue to exist and perhaps would have been unviable as an independent state if it were not for the discovery of the oil and gas by the British. Following initial drilling in 1899, commercial flow of oil was discovered by Royal Dutch Shell at Surya Brunei in 1929. At the time of writing, Brunei Shell Petroleum operated more than a thousand and the world's fourth largest producers of liquid and natural gas. Upon achieving independence in July 1990, on the occasion of the Sultan's 
44th birthday, the concept of Melayo Islam Bihara or Malay Islamic Monarchy or MIB was enunciated. Promoting a National Ideology Melayo Islam Bihara, Malay Islamic Monarchy or MIB, the concept was formulated by officials close to the regime who attempted to define Bruanian identity in terms of people's attachment to Malay culture, the Islamic religion, and the loyalty to the monarchy. Omar Ali, the present sultan, sees MIB as a means to create a unifying ideology which would bolster his power, blunt the appeal of those calling for a stricter observance of Islam, and develop a sense of purpose in the young. MIB is a blend of Malay language, culture, and Malay customs. The teaching of Islamic laws and values and the monarchy system which must be esteemed and practiced by all. Islam, official and state religion of Brunei. MIB opposes the concept of secularism. The MIB situates the Sultan as the center of the nation and of Islam. With a Friday attendance at mosques around the country, Absolute Monarchy Brunei Darussalam is an absolute monarchy in which the Sultan has in effect complete political power over all matters. The Sultan is also the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister, and the Defense Minister. While he may take advice from legislative council or ministers of both which he appoints, he is not obliged to do so. The Sultan of Brunei Darussalam Sultan Hassan al Bolkeya. Sultan Bulkeya, one of the world's richest men, with a personal wealth estimated to be up to $20 billion. He built a new palace, the Istana Nurul Iman, which houses government ministers as well as the royal family. The palace is reported to have 1,788 rooms and 110 car garage. The construction of the palace is estimated up to $1.4 billion and it is the largest occupied palace in the world. The gross domestic product or the GDP of Brunei Darussalam. Because of their GDP, health care, education, and free taxes are given to their citizens. I enjoy a high per capita GDP based on oil export income and increasing an oil-based sovereign wealth fund rather than wider economic development. About 90% of Brunei's export income and more than half its GDP is based on oil, with that and associated industries employing about a quarter of the workforce. In Brunei Darussalam, most of the people are dependent to the oil and gas of the country, and most of the workers or the people in Brunei works for the gas and oil company of Brunei Darussalam. Conventional Modernization Theory According to Modernization Theory, the middle class pushes for a change and greater political participation and this ultimately causes the downfall of monarchies. However, oil-dependent Gulf monarchies in the Middle East and Brunei have been able to avert this individuality and have instead evolved and flourished as a neo-traditional state. Main scholars have questioned the viability of absolute monarchies. Modernization theorists such as Hong Ting Ton argue that monarchical regimes are not able to withstand the pressure of modern state building. These monarchies continue to be conservative, paternalistic, and highly authoritarian. So, this conventional modernization theory suggests that they want to end the monarchical rule, but instead, in the present sultan of Brunei, he appointed the middle class or those educated people in Brunei to be, become, to be part of his ministers. The Crown Prince of Brunei Darussalam, the Sultan's eldest son, Crown Prince Haji Al-Muntadi Billah, was appointed as a senior minister in 2005 and has increasing deputized for his father in part in order to ensure smooth succession. The Sultan has been grooming the Crown Prince since 1998. The first son of the Crown Prince, Abdul Muntakim, born 2007, is next in line to succeed Muntadi to Brunei's throne. System of Governance in Brunei Darussalam 
In terms of governance, the Sultan is supported by five consultative councils, each of which are appointed by the Sultan and which he heads. They include the Privy Council, which advises on constitutional and customary issues, the Council of Succession, which is effectively passive as succession in determined by the Constitution, and the Religious Council, which advises on matters pertaining to Islam. Members of the Religious Council include ministers, a deputy minister, and in Brunei is called Pingeran Chiteria, first minister with blood ties to the royal family. Pihin Mantiris, which means life ministers or ministers for life, state mufti, Muslim legal expert, legal attorney, represented by the attorney general, shire, Islamic, chief justice, and others are appointed by the sultan, who is also the official state religious head. Brunei's legal system is based on that inherited from the United Kingdom, employing common law, but much of which is now codified, combined with a separate Islamic court dealing with matters of Islamic law. There is also the Council of Ministers and the Legislative. The 2004 Constitutional Amendments As Brunei enters the 21st century and matures as a nation, many in Brunei were expecting the reinstitution of elections and opportunity for participation in government. However, a series of constitutional amendments announced in 2004 have given the Sultan greater power. Its members were all appointed and included by the Sultan. His brother, the Crown Prince, cabinet ministers, prominent members of society as well as representatives from various districts. The Resurrected Legislative Council was given the task to pass the 2004 constitutional amendments including new legislation designed to enrich the Sultan as an absolute sovereign. The new amendments clarify the power of the Sultan, giving him supreme authority and placing him above the law in both his official and personal capacity. The constitutional amendments also undermine the rule of the Legislative Council. Despite provision for election, the council has thus compromised only appointed members and meets annually in March to raise questions about the budget and governance issues for concern to the public. According to the 1959, the council has an advisory rule and needed to give consent before any law can be passed. However, the 2004 amendments did away with these provisions, thus effectively making the legislative council a meaningless rubber stamp chamber. They have said this because they all depend to the monarch. It always depends on what would the monarch believe and what would the monarch decide. It is unlikely that direct elections for legislative council members will be held in the near future because as what I have said, the Sultan is always in direct control of everything that will happen in Brunei Darussalam. Sharia law. The official state of religion of Shafi Islam was made increasingly strict in 2004 when the Sultan unitarily introduced a literalist interpretation of Sharia, further limiting already restrictive social freedoms. The strict new laws were to be introduced in three phases. In 2015, the new laws known as Hubud Restriction on Crimes Against God include the failure to observe call of prayers, be impunishable with fines or even jail. This law included the adoption of strict Sharia law or Sharia punishment, including whipping, amputation of hands for teeth and stoning to death for illicit sex such as adultery, homosexuality, and apostasy, which means abandoning Islam. The Sultan promotes the idea of a clean government, which in theory extends to the members of the royal family. According to Brunei's education minister, Awang Abu Bakar, MIB was not a slogan but a system regulating the way of life. This ideology has become an important basis of Sultan's political legitimacy. It evaluates Islam as the national religion upholds the right and the privileges of the Malay ethnic community and justifies the hereditary monarchy as a relevant governing system. This ideology allows the monarchy to situate and as to protect Islam, offering on the office even greater legitimacy. 
The new laws could also apply to all people in Brunei and not just its majority Muslims. The Sultan hit back international criticism of the laws, saying people outside of Brunei should respect us in the same way that we respect them. Already an observant Islamic State, this further unilateral move towards a more strict interpretation of Sharia reflected arbitrary decision-making available to an absolute monarchy. The new laws were introduced by the Sultan under his protection of Islam in Brunei, which is part of the national ideology and which shores up the Sultan's popularity with the majority approximately two-thirds ethnic Malay community. This is shift towards what is portrayed as a true Islam is directly linked to the Sultan's rule. Support for true Islam also implies support for monarch and vice versa. This Sharia law seems very strict to most of people in the world but for the Sultan we should also respect them because these laws are made for the people of Brunei to be more united and this is one of the stage in which they develop state building. Branches of government in Brunei Darussalam Executive, its main powers, the Sultan has the absolute executive authority, it appoints legislative council members and the Supreme Court. Election process, the Sultan as the Prime Minister are hereditary. Election cycle, hereditary. The judicial, its main powers, the Supreme Court is the highest court of the land. Sharia deals with Islamic law matters. Election process, Supreme Court judges are appointed by the monarch. The Sharia Court of Appeal judges is appointed by the monarch. Election cycle, Supreme Court judges can serve until 65. Sharia Court of Appeals judges have no term limits. The legislative and its main powers, the legislative council advises the Sultan. Election process. The Legislative Council has 33 members who are appointed by the Sultan. Election cycle until dismissal by the Sultan. Brunei also practices a high degree of censorship with a license able to be revoked at any time. And the country's main newspaper, the Borneo Bulletin, being controlled by the Sultan's family. The private press is either owned or controlled by the royal family. It exercises censorship on political and religious matters. The Freedom House identifies Brunei as, in political terms, not free. Brunei society is strictly regulated and the media is tightly controlled. The government has the power to shut down media outlets and under the 2015 Sedition Act may jail journalists for up to three years for criticizing the Sultan and the royal family. Centralized Power Authority is centralized and the Sultan rules, assisted and advised by various councils such as the Council of Minister and the Privy Council. The cabinet presently consisting of 10 members is responsible for government administration. The Sultan presides over the cabinet and apart from being Prime Minister, also holds ministerial portfolios for defense and finance. He maintains that the centralization of power, although useful for social economic change, does not provide sufficient incentives for monarchs to expand their social base and accommodate the demands of the social groups and produced by the process of modernization. Brunei monarchy has been successful in centralizing power in the office of the Sultan, has drawn on traditional religious sources for legitimacy and has shown itself to be stable regime. It has managed to avoid demands for political reform by making effective and expeditious use of its hydrocarbon revenues through the provision of extensive and generous welfare programs. Conclusion It would appear that independence did not result in any important challenge to Brunei's monarchical system. Royal supremacy has been sustained and ideological framework that is both modern and Islamic has been institutionalized. As a semi-traditional polity, Brunei has shown itself capable of providing for the modern needs of its citizens and evidently promoted stability, legitimacy, and internal cohesion.
It may be the case that economic development and modernity, the spread of literacy, has resulted in intensifying feelings of loyalty towards Brunei nation and the Sultan, while simultaneously consolidation the institution of the monarchy. As we can observe that Brunei Darussalam monarchical rule has been doing its best in providing the needs of its people. But frankly, the people in Brunei Darussalam are not free in doing things that they want because they are afraid that they might offend the monarch. It was never easy for the people of Brunei Darussalam to follow the strict rules of the Sultan, but they don't have a choice since the Sultan have given its people free education, free health care, and free taxes for those government employees. Good day everyone, I'm Marielle Desiree B. Kukin and I will be talking to you about Myanmar from Praetorian rule to democratic transitions. Now, once given the discourse when it comes to Southeast Asia, we all know that Myanmar is somehow not inside the limelight. Not necessarily because it's somehow not a part of Southeast Asia, but rather because it's not shown light upon because it's ha it has been secretive when it comes to economy and politics throughout the Praetorian rule of the military dictatorship. Now, first, in order to fully grasp the title, let us first um, know where Myanmar is located. So, where is Myanmar located? It is located, as you can see in the um, illustration, in the center of India, China, and Thailand. Now, presumably, because of the surrounding states that um, encapsulate the state of Burma or Myanmar, um, you expect its economy to be booming, it to be a very um, rich country, because, of course, how many opportunities could being beside these um, certain states offer you when it, ter when it comes to um, economies. However, in reality, that is not the case of Myanmar. Myanmar is a third world country. As a matter of fact, it was um, labeled by the UN as one of the least developed states present within the world. So why was this like this? What happened to Myanmar? Well, the reason for it is its Praetorian rule. Now, what is a Praetorian rule? A Praetorian rule is somehow a military dictatorship and a civilian bureaucracy lodged in the very center, dictating the actual course of the political regime. So somehow it's a military dictatorship that um, that has a more chauvinistic approach whenever it comes to the relationship of the civil people or the civilians and the military dictators. So in order for us to grasp the democratization or the democratic transitions as to why they were formulated, what catapulted it um, into its existence, we must first discuss the history of Myanmar. So the history of Myanmar concerns um, three segments, namely pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial period. So first is the Pagan Empire. Now, as we all know, the Pagan Empire is somehow um, what made Southeast Asia before in the prehistoric period because the Pagan Empire was a big kingdom and somehow it is actually Burma. Bagan, former Bagan, and the recent Bagan of Myanmar are the same and this certain Bagan was um, the center or the capital and this pagan empire was founded by King Anorata and during these times the state has um, progressed into a certain level to which other monarchies rather couldn't um, cope up with because um, King Anaurata at that time, he liked the idea of Buddhism, so then he later on inculcated it in his state leadership. So this brought us to a point where in, due to the Buddhism present, literacy peaked because um, education was a part of attaining Buddhism. However, just like any other empire, pagan empire eventually went down the drain and 
dissipated because of um, certain divisiveness after a while of being in supremacy. So after the pagan empire, the Ava empire became the successor because amongst the small kingdoms in Myanmar, it was Ava that um, catapulted to supremacy during those times. After Ava became the successor, uh, it also failed and then the Tungu Empire then flourished. The Tungu Empire is the largest Burmese and Southeast Asian empire unifying the former pagan empire states. So it was at these times where in the largest Burmese empire uh, was fully in action because by 1635, the Burmese crown began to conduct comprehensive censuses and provincial manpower and tax collection. So through this, we can see that it was really a fully functioning, hence sustainable state but not as sustainable as we think it is because after that, the Konbang dynasty began to flourish as well and became the successor of the Tungu Empire. This Konbang dynasty is the second largest Burmese empire and it, of course, again, unified Burma. However, it was during these times that monarchy, hence the empires, stopped due to the British colonies that colonized Myanmar or Burma. So this leads us to the colonial period which started with three Anglo-Burma or Burmese wars. Now these wars happened during 1825, 1852, and 1885. So it started with the Konbao dynasty in 1825 who expanded westward toward India or British India at that time. And this certain expansion led to the unclear border present in both countries. So this then waged war between the British colonial forces, including that of Burma's rather. And then the second one happened in 1852 when the British forces captured Pegu, which is one of the Burmese territories. And lastly, by 1885 happened the full conquering of the British colonial power of Myanmar or Burma at that time. And this certain um, conquering Burma sent the last king of the Konbang dynasty. So they were sent out of Burma into India to halt the monarchy. So next to this was when January 1st, 1886, um, Burma officially became a colony of the British India. So despite the fact that India and Burma weren't really necessarily culturally tied together, however, the British rule um, merged them both together and hence um, Burma as a province of British India. And during these times, um, the Burmese have abruptly altered their culture because they were accustomed to the means of statehood through joining between the state and the state's governance as well as Buddhism, which was their main religion. And during these times, there wasn't that. And apart from that, their monarchy was abolished. So during that time, the economy was soaring. However, the irony about this is that although the economy was soaring, it wasn't the Burmese that got the positive outtakes from this. It was the people who weren't from Burma, which were the Indies or Indians rather, and the British people who conquered Burma during that time because every time that there was land, the land ownership wasn't of Burmese peoples, but rather of either the elite class, which were the Indians, and also the British. 
and then the workers were just the ones who are burning me so there really had a rather unfairness when it comes to economy well governance its main medium for brainwashing was or were schools because schools were institutions to which the British could impose their ideas as well as um, frown upon the already existing ideas of Burma as if it never really existed so um, it gave them an opportunity to really rewire the people's brains as to thinking that Burmese culture wasn't the way to be and another thing here that happened during 1886 was the Burma Convention of 1886 now this Burma Convention concerned two countries specifically Chinese and British governments this stated that the Chinese government recognizes the colonial British rule and governance over Upper Burma then agreed to have a reciprocal trade promo promotion with China and Burma. Now the next period was 1906. The Young Men's Buddhist Association was formed which is a group that built schools supporting Buddhist teaching. So this is rather a reply toward the brainwashing of the Europeans followed by the 1910 incident wherein the first Irish Buddhist monk Yu Damaloka challenged the ways of imperialism and Christianity and was actually put to trial by 1911. So next would be by 1920, we're in London, educated elites multiplied because people of Burma could then have education in London. After that, this London educated elites have then um, affected 1923, which was a point of Myanmar wherein a student group in Rangoon University protested over their British professors. This was later named as the Thakin Movement. By 1930, another rebellion or an uprising arose yet again, which is the Sayasan Rebellion, um, led by Sayasan, which is a Burmese peasant together with other working class people, rebelled as an attempt rather to arrest their monarchy as well as their traditions as Burmese people however this was rather not effective but still Sayasan and the Sayasan rebellion was a quintessential part of Southeast Asian national uprisings so by 1937 Burma was separated from India and was granted its own constitution Ba Mao became the first prime minister. After that, by 1938, the 1,300 revolution started as a protest of the working class over unfair wages, but later on, it spread all throughout Burma and involved not just the working class, but rather just people who vowed for nationalist uprisings. And because of that, a total of 33 people were killed and 17 students were some of them and were also killed during the same day. Also included Ong Kiao at that time and now he is renowned as the student who became a martyr for his country. By 1939, Bamao allied with the Japanese in the hopes of getting Burmese independence. This is because he thought that being allies with the Japanese would fasten their independence as Burmese people as well as that the Japanese would then cooperate in such sense that they would want to. However, by 1940, Takin Ong San and his fellow Takins, meaning the nationalist uprisers or the people who were of the nationalist movement, were smuggled to Tokyo in order to lay their groundwork against the British rule. By 1941, Burma's Independence Army was created with Aung San rather as the um, leader. And this group constituted 30 comrades and believed that Burmese independence would just be attained if there is armed struggle. And this struggle was then 
also prepared for by smuggling their members to Japan for military training. By 1942, the Japanese invaded Burma with the help of the BIA, which later on they disbanded and a smaller Burmese military organization was formed while Ba Mao still remained as prime minister. By 1943, Japanese granted Burmese independence and provided a Burma National Army headed by Aung San. Bama still remained the head of state, having a lack of power, later on did not abide and cooperate with the Japanese because of what Colonel Suzuki told him. He told him that such act was pure strategy and that the independence wasn't really given to them by um, pure intentions. And by 1944, the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League was formed as an underground anti-fascist leadership, realizing that the Japanese um, leadership was rather worse than that of the British. And then by 1945, during March 25th, General Aung San led an uprising against the Japanese. And both the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League and Patriotic Burmese Forces commemorated the first unification of Burma or Burmese people against a common enemy. Since Aung San's party, Later on, won 248 out of 250 seats of the legislative branch, and therefore, they had to begin the draft of the constitution. By 1947, despite being assumed as prime minister after the elections, Aung San was assassinated even before he was sat as the prime minister. A year after that, at least, by 1948, UNU became the head of state of Burma, and Burma then became independent of any colonial rule. Burma Independence Act of 1947 was the act that contains it all and was named as the Union of Burma on July 4th, 1948. Now, um, UNU's time, at least his first term, was as historians say, a brief democracy, since it was swift, but it was a democracy. And this democracy later on crippled because New's extreme Buddhist approach caused multiple ethnic wars due to the fact that um, ethnic groups as well as communist groups felt as if they were isolated apart from the whole of Burma. So they started civil wars and later on it emerged throughout the whole of Burma. Because of these civil wars, UNU then failed to tame the civil wars present within the Union of Burma. That is why he then was replaced by Ne Win. And this Ne Win was a token. However, he did love um, the military dictatorship and socialism as um, a blueprint of how he ran the whole state of Burma. However, by 1960, UNU won again after the general elections and Nevin stepped down, eventually having a parliamentary government again. So, by 1962, Nevin staged a coup against UNU and became the leader of a military dictatorship in Burma. And under this rule, a lot of oppression transpired. And these oppressions can be namely, constitution was suspended. He also banned any form of freedom of expression. He was inspired by the Burmese way to socialism through Burma Socialist Program Party. And then another thing were the soaring of the human rights abuses. Major industries were nationalized, insurgencies were answered via state force, and that was what he called as good governance, and then rather isolation of Burmese economy. For the next year would be 1987, 
wherein demonetization occurred during September and it greatly crippled the people's ability to buy goods. Hence, the um, Burmese economy plummeted. And by 1988, July, Nguyen announced stepping down while demonstrations broke out during the Democracy Summer. Now, this Democracy Summer was when there still wasn't any person to success after Nguyen. And then, therefore, it was a rather period of a democratic breathe from all the uh, military dictatorship and it was only up until August of these 1988 uprisings that peaked and it also was called 8888 uprisings it was because it happened on August 8th of 1988 rather which soared all over Burma everybody hence whatever um, background they had um, they participated in order for the clamor for democracy to be seen by the government. It was also during this time that Aung San, who was the assassinated prime minister or prime minister-to-be of Burma, and um, his daughter, Aung San Suu Kyi, returned to Burma to join the democratic movement. And the military imposed martial law and made a 19-member state law and order restoration council to govern it because the uprisings were beginning to become out of hand. So by 1989, Suu Kyi was later put to house arrest because of her participation in the democratic movement. Now we move to 1990. The State Law and Order Restoration Council conducted an election that turned out to be fair and free. So during this election, Suu Kyi won overwhelmingly. However, um, with the military seeing this, they did not recognize her win. Hence, her win was technically not abided. By 1993, a national convention was scheduled to formulate a constitution to prepare the country for democracy. However, ironically it is, the National League of Democracy didn't participate in this. By 2003, the roadmap to democracy was introduced by Kim Nyan, and under these are processes to which Myanmar or Burma would undergo through in order to at least attain the democratic state that they want to at least attain. And by 2007, the UN encouraged Suu Kyi to partake in peace talks with the opposition leaders in order to at least normalize the situation. And it was also these times that multiple protests across the country emerged because of the abolishing of subsidies on the state's crisis on fuel, the revolution was called the Saffron Revolution, and because of this, the wars around Burma transpired yet again and was then labeled as the longest running civil war in the world. By 2008, the constitution was ratified with democratic provisions. By 2010, an election was executed But the National League of Democracy boycotted it. By 2015, five years later, people voted for the National League of Democracy into power. By 2016, Suu Kyi was elected as state councillor or the de facto leader of Myanmar. Now, this brings us to the current political system and constitution. Since we've already seen how the state of Burma became independent, and the state of Burma as a statehood, meaning with all the sovereignty and all the political changes, at least we could now um, move over then to the current political system and constitution. Now, the current political system embedded in Myanmar or Burma is a unitary parliamentary republic. Now, when you say unitary, the power emanates from the central government. And then when you say parliamentary, the head of the state and the head of the government are highest positions, with the head of government holding real power. And the republic 
is the one ruled by representatives of the citizens. So now we have Myanmar's executive and judicial branch. But before that, we must also um, put into consideration the 2008 constitution provision regarding the three branches of sovereign power, namely legislative, executive, and judicial power are separated to the extent possible, hence they are alike once in the democratic systems we have today. Now, the executive branch may, is made up of president, state councilor, and vice presidents. And these vice presidents are composed of two people, one for the president and one for the state councilor. So the president is the head of state, while the state councilor is the head of government. Well, the vice presidents assume these positions once the said positions, the state councilor and president, are incapacitated or the people under the said positions are incapacitated. On the judicial branch, the highest form of court is the Supreme Court of the Union and um, below it are high courts of the region and then later on subjugates to more local branches. Now let us go to the legislative branch of Myanmar or the Union of Burma. The legislative branch, as per the 2008 constitution, is a bicameral body called Hyadungsu Lutao or Assembly of the Union. Now, since it's bicameral, it has two chambers which are the upper house and the lower house. Now, the upper house is called Amyotha Lutao, while the lower house is called Pyuthu Lutao. The upper house consists of 224 seats and 50 of which are appointed by the military while the remaining 168 are elected by the people. While on the lower house, it consists of 440 seats with 330 of which being elected and 110 seats are appointed by the military. So the elections occur every five years. The president as well as the elected seats in the legislature and the decentralized government have five years in position. The country had 16 general elections since 1922. On the 2008 constitution with um, democratic provisions or technically what other political analysts would say as the main thing that transition the country toward democracy was this constitution. Now, under this constitution, they had provisions that could be seen in a real democratic state in practice. Now, these provisions state that the union should guarantee that every law shall be equally provided legal protection. And then another one of which was also the non-discrimination of multiple ethnic minorities and also the liberty to exercise freedom of one's speech and etc. Now these are controversial ones because as we see today, just by 2018, under Suki's governance as state councilor, the Rohingya crisis or the Muslim Rohingya or Rohingya Muslims rather crisis um, occurred, wherein it was labeled by the UN as the Rohingya genocide because the Buddhist people, as well as um, people of government, were murdering people of the Rohingya Muslim belief. That is why Suki later on had a negative view toward people. However, contradictory to the freedom inspired or liberty or democratically inspired provisions of the constitution, here are the rather still present, still evident military dominance within the constitution that is provided. Under this, as we've stated earlier, 
when we were tackling the legislative branch, um, the head of military shall be the one to appoint 25% of the legislative branch. No duly elected members of the legislature can amend the constitution without confirmation of the commander-in-chief of the military. So just by that statement means that 25% of the seats present in the legislature will always go to which military officials they um, appoint, hence not fully gaining the majority of the legislature. And then second of all, another provision would be regarding the state councilors, state councilor standards in order for them to be enough as a leader of the nation, shall he himself, one of the parents, the spouse, one of the legitimate children, or their spouses, not owe allegiance to foreign powers. So now this is the um, this is the provision under the 2008 constitution that did not apply to Suki since he she had a spouse of foreign nationality which was british as well as her son so she wasn't really permitted under the constitution to become a leader now let's move on to decentralization now multiple people say that myanmar is centralized and that it was struggling to decentralize which is as a matter of fact true that somehow to this date decentralization has been a hard task in order for them to achieve that is why there are only three efforts to which the country wants to at least decentralize one of which is regional flute house and uh, these regional ones are basically the legislature but then on the regional scale and then by number two which our chief ministers are basically leaders of these said lutaos that are also elected regionally. While the third one and most important one is the ethnic affairs minister. This ethnic affairs minister is a person elected by his or her own um, ethnic group chosen to represent the ethnic group itself as a whole. So, in conclusion, the Praetorian rule was a reflection of Myanmar's colonial past, especially during the Japanese period, because it was within this period that they were inspired by their fascist regime of the Japanese. Secondly, their open economy aided them toward the starting of the process of state building. This is because with their openness amongst um, international countries, they then have paved new paths for their trades to flourish as well as their politics to flourish. Third is the genesis of state building is exogenous due to the outside pressure of economic advancements. Now this is the case when we talk about the recent state building of Myanmar. Its sustainability was pioneered because of the need to advance since the pressure amongst the neighboring states were high and they needed to open up their country in order to accommodate much economic advancements however when you say the birth of their statehood then therefore it is also exogenous since it was the japanese rule that made them independent and that actually aided them toward being independent timor leste east timor or the democratic republic of timor leste a country part of the Southeast Asia bloc, lodged between Indonesia and Papua, the only Asian country to be completely located under the equator, and the newest and first sovereign state to enter the 21st century. Hi everyone, I am Jessel Pupinia Flor and I am your reporter for the state building of the newly independent state, Timor-Leste. Let us go way back to the pre-colonial period of Timor-Leste. Nothing much can be said in the pre-colonial Timor-Leste, but according to early European contact documents, the various cultures of East Timor were organized into small chiefdoms or princedom. There were no nations in Timor Island. Thus, 
In the past, Timor-Leste was made up of many different cultural groups and many different chiefdoms. The same document also mentions the existence of a complex ritual, marriage and economic alliance system among some of the various clans of Titun, Bunak and Kena. This is followed by the Portuguese colonial period. This period has several significances for the social-political development of Timor-Leste. So in 1500s, the Portuguese arrived in the island of Timor, mainly focused on sandalwood trading. So they have established uh, multiple trading posts in Timor. In addition, it is also during this period that Catholicism was introduced to the Timorese people, a legacy or a mark left by colonialism. And as a matter of fact, 90% or more of the current population of Timor-Leste today are Roman Catholics. So in particular, it is during the arrival of Dominican friar Antonio Tavera in 1556, which marked officially the commencement of the more widespread missionizing effort. The event that followed is the arrival of the Dutch. So in 1653, the Dutch arrived and defeated the military post of Portuguese in Kupang, which was in West Timor, and with a heavy military force took over in 1656. So at this point, the people of Timor Island were caught in the tug of war of political and economic struggle between Dutch and Portuguese, a struggle that precedes the colonial presence of both the power in East Timor and had lasting political and territorial consequences into the present. In territorial terms, Timor Island was divided into the western and the eastern part. This is particularly during the 1859 Treaty of Lisbon, which is a treaty of boundary demarcation, giving Portuguese the eastern half of Timor and the Dutch the western half. Therefore, the roots of the current division of Timor Island between Indonesia Timor and East Timor or Timor-Leste lies in this period. Furthermore, during the Portuguese colonial period, Timor-Leste remained a backwater colony. So Portuguese was not conducive to growth and had very little impact in technological advancement. And there is a serious lack of investment in both infrastructure and human development. And in the political aspect, in 19th century, Portuguese colonial power initially had very little power, and numerous indigenous uprisings against the Portuguese occurred. At this point, the Portuguese realized that the power is still very much in native control, and a function of indigenous political and ritual alliances among local kingdoms and chiefdoms. So by the late 19th century, Portuguese attempted to establish effective control over their colony in terms of political control. And between the late 19th and 20th century, Portuguese devised and implemented new policies that were supposed to break the monopoly of local traditional political system. There were two major components to this strategy. One, the economic nature. In the economic front, they introduced policies of forced East Timorese labor for road construction and the introduction of cash crop plantations. In 1908, the levied head tax on all East Timorese males between the ages of 18 to 60. Second is the administrative nature. The other component of the strategy was the abolition of local kingdoms and the position of the Liurai or the king and chief. They introduced new administrative units which were based on the units below the kingdom level in the indigenous political structure called Suko. The election then or more often the confirmation of leaders of the Suko was subject to the approval of the Portuguese. So through this reorganization, the Portuguese aimed to break down the traditional authority and introduce an authority that is not dependent on kinship alliances. This period has also made way to the rise of national liberation and the birth of political parties or groups that would play a major role in the independence, state building, and current political system of Timor Leste. In 1974, the Carnation Revolution took place, which is the overthrowing of the existing government in Portugal, which is the Caetano regime. This created a power vacuum in East Timor. So with the Carnation Revolution in Portugal in 1974, an uncertainty over the territory's future was seen. Thus, 
nascent political parties began to emerge to fill the political vacuum. Important ones were the Timorese Democratic Union or UDT that was founded on May 11, 1974. Their goal was to work towards independence while continuing to associate with Portugal in the long transition period. Another is the Timorese Social Democratic Association or ASDT, founded on May 20, 1974 with the idea of full independence. By September, the group changed its name to the Revolutionary Front for an independent East Timor, or Fretilin as we know today. So, while Fretilin called for immediate independence, their unity rivals preferred a gradual transition. The different visions for the future, as well as the fight over political power in East Timor, led to a civil war between the UDT and Fretilin, in which the latter emerged victorious with the help of its armed wing Falintil, or Forcas Armadas de Libertacao Nacional de Timor Leste. Moreover, it is said that Indonesia took the UDT coup that was quickly suppressed by Fretilin. This led Indonesian President Suharto to brand Fretilin a communist threat. And on November 1975, Fretilin declared independence and proclaimed the Democratic Republic of East Timor. This independence, however, was short-lived because just days after its declared independence, East Timor was occupied by Indonesia and this marked the long and brutal guerrilla war that followed over the next 24 years. On December 1975, viewing the prospects of a free East Timor as a security threat, Indonesian forces launched a massive air and sea invasion known as Operasi Seroja or Operation Komodo, occupying East Timor to supposedly protect it from communism. On July 1976, Indonesia's President Suharto, despite of UN's condemnation of his action, formally annexed East Timor, declaring it as Indonesia's 27th province. Despite repression from Indonesian authorities, Public protests have increased, and one of those public display of resistance that got the world's attention the most is the Santa Cruz Cemetery Massacre. This happened on November 12, 1991, where Indonesian military opened fire on protesters at close range, killing more than 250 people. It was this massacre that brought the political conflict of East Timor back on public agenda. But the turning point for East Timorese independence was the replacement of Indonesian President Suharto by Beji Habibi, who allowed more political autonomy for the region. Thus, the status of East Timor was raised again after Bakarudin J. Habibi signaled his willingness to discuss the future status of East Timor. An agreement between Indonesia and Portugal, with endorsement by the United Nations, was concluded on May 5, 1999, in which the East Timorese people were finally given the opportunity to vote on their political future in a free and due and monitored election. The two options available were 1. Special autonomy within Indonesia, or 2. Full independence. In a second agreement, also concluded on May 5, 1999, Indonesia, Portugal, and the United Nations specified the modalities for the popular consultation. To organize and supervise the vote, the Security Council established UNAMET on June 11, 1999. Initially planned for August 8, the referendum eventually took place in August 30, 1999, and with an overall turnout of 98%, 78.5% of the votes were cast in favor of independence. What then makes Timor Leste's path to independence different from other countries that underwent similar experiences? Timor Leste became independent under the auspices of the United Nations, and thus, Timor Leste's state building approach is one that is highly exogenous, with external factor or international actors playing major roles in the process. United Nations intervention in Timor Leste played a major role in its achievement of independence. So the UN peace operations in East Timor since 1999 have evolved in phases. First is the creation of UNAMED. 
UN Security Council Resolution 1246 authorized the United Nations Mission in East Timor or UNAMED, established in June 11, 1999, to organize a national referendum in August on East Timor status and, depending on the outcome, oversee the transition period. This is followed by the creation of Interfet. After the violent post-referendum rampage began and with Indonesia's agreement, on September 12, 1999, the Security Council on September 15 passed Resolution 1264 authorizing establishment of Interfet, a non-UN multinational force. Next is the creation of UNTAET. The United Nations Transitional Authority for East Timor or UNTAET was established by UN Security Council Resolution 1272 on October 25, 1999. This was led by Sergio Vera D. Melio, the then UNTAET administrator. This is to provide a UN-conducted multidimensional peacekeeping operation to administer East Timor through its transition to independence. UNTAET's mandate was broad, and it included assisting East Timor to 1. Recover from the violence through humanitarian aid and reconstruction assistance, 2. Establish a functioning government, and 3. Aid East Timorese who fled or were forcibly transported to Indonesia West Timor during the violence. And on May 17, 2002, Security Council Resolution 1410 established a successor mission to UNTAET the United Nations Mission of Support in East Timor, or UNMISET, for an initial period of 12 months. Subsequent resolutions then extended the mandate at six-month intervals until May 20, 2005. And finally, on April 28, 2005, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1599, establishing the United Nations Office in Timor-Leste, or UNETEL. It is a special political mission to carry out peace-building activities and mandated for one year until May 19, 2006. So UNOTEL activities included support for state institutions such as national capacity in justice and finance, strengthening democratic governance and observance of human rights, and supporting the development of a national police force, particularly the Border Patrol Unit. Other external actors and international involvement is that of the United States. So U.S. aid programs in East Timor with the goal of building a viable, self-sufficient free market economy, developing basic public services such as health, and supporting good governance through an emerging democratic political system and post-conflict democracy initiatives. So U.S. assistance has helped the economic and political development of East Timor by supporting independent media, civil society organizations, and political parties, as well as strengthening the electoral process building judicial institutions, and strengthening governmental capacity. Also, Australia and New Zealand have played an active role in support of peace and security in Timor-Leste since the 1999 referendum and have been key providers of peacekeeping troops for the purpose. So, it is against this backdrop of history that one can begin to understand the nation-state of Timor-Leste today. Timor-Leste is a democratic republic subject to the rule of law. The respect for law and human decency is enshrined in its 2002 constitution and the objectives of the state are in accord with the most valued principle of the UN. Timor-Leste's political systems and its constitution is closely based on the 1976 version used by Portugal, its former colonial power. Timor-Leste is a parliamentary republic in which legislative authority is vested in the parliament and executive authority is held by the president and the government composed of prime minister and cabinet. Prime Minister The prime minister shall be designated by the political party or alliance of political parties with parliamentary majority and shall be appointed by the president of the republic after consultation with political parties sitting in the national parliament. Cabinet Ministers Cabinet ministers are usually chosen from within the parliament, but they may also be selected outside the parliament. 
and reflecting the influence of the UN in incorporating women more actively into public life, at least one in three candidates in each party must be a woman. This has given Timor-Leste 38% representation of women in parliament the highest proportion in Asia Pacific region and among the highest in the world. President. According to the 2002 Constitution, the President of the Republic is the head of state and the symbol and guarantor of national independence and unity of the state and of the regular functioning of democratic institutions. And, according to Kingsbury, since or because Timor Lesa's first two presidents Jose Ramos Horta and Sanana Guzmao has been politically active and occasionally exceeded their constitutional authority. And because of the derivation of Timor Lasse's constitution to an earlier Portuguese version, which itself devolves considerable power to the president, Timor Leste has regularly, if incorrectly, been identified as having semi presidential political system. The legislative power is vested upon the national parliament. The 2002 constitution says that national parliament is organ of sovereignty of the Democratic Republic of East Timor that represents all Timorese citizens with legislative supervisory and political decision-making powers. Judicial branch. In the Democratic Republic of East Timor, there shall be the following categories of courts. A. The Supreme Court of Justice and other courts of law. B. The High Administrative, Tax and Audit Court and other administrative courts of first instance. And C. Military Courts. In addition, UNTAED created a civil law court system with 13 district courts of appeal in March 2000. Timor-Leste's political arena remains dominated by figures associated with securing Timor-Leste's liberation. According to Powell's 2012, participation in the resistance to the Indonesian occupation remains a powerful source of political legitimacy and debates over an inclusion or exclusion of certain actors from the narrative of national liberation have been tools in electoral campaigning and public discourse. And speaking of participation in resistance, one of the key actors is resistance leader Keirala Sanana Guzmao, who was previously a part of Fretilin Party. However, his split initially arose in 1988 when Guzmao took Fretilin's guerrilla force, Valentil, out of the party and made it a national army, initially under the umbrella organization, the National Council for Mobile Resistance, which evolved into National Council for Timorese Resistance, or CNRT, as we know today. So, Sanana Guzmao had been the towering figure in Timor Leste's politics and a great stabilizing influence, especially after the chaos of 2006 to 2007. Since 2008, Guzmao had been the key stabilizer of Timor Leste's politics and a centralizing force in political decision making. He attracted criticism for personalizing power, yet Timor Leste's minister have often been inept and without central decision making, little would have been achieved. Thus, his resignation as Prime Minister in February 2015 and the appointment of a new cabinet marked a fundamental change in the young country's political landscape. Timor Leste's political landscape is diverse, but two parties, the Fretilin and CNRT, have between them occupied most parliamentary seats since 2007. Despite receiving high levels of international assistance over more than a decade, as noted by an EU assessment, though the government has made great strides, institutional capacity remains weak in Timor Leste. The weaknesses that continued to need to be addressed, as noted by the EU, includes skills and knowledge, systems and processes, and attitudes and behaviors. Parliament, and in particular its committees, regularly fail to meet a quorum and the legislative process is backlogged, not assisted by legislation being drafted in Portuguese while the language of Parliament is a tomb, with most parliamentarians being illiterate in Portuguese. Furthermore, 
Government jobs are commonly seen as sinecure rather than a service, and there is a high level of reluctance to make decisions even in matters well within the authority of individual officers up to and including ministers. In all, it is widely regarded to be safer or a safer to do nothing and not make mistakes than to actually do things but risk errors. According to Mario 2008, Timor-Leste's legal system functions relatively well in rudimentary sense but faces a number of serious problems. As a result of too few trained judges, there is a backlog of cases with limited access to justice for more remote communities. In addition, according to Timor-Leste's judicial system's monitoring program, the justice sector in Timor-Leste has come a long way since independence, but there remains a continuing need for further assistance to develop local capacity and to ensure the independence and efficacy of the justice sector. Timor-Leste remains two very different worlds, divided between the globalized capital Dili and the isolated and poorly serviced rural hinterland. In the course of the years since independence, different solutions have been adopted by Timor-Leste regarding SUCOS and other subnational units. From 2004, elections have been staged for what has been labeled lideranzas comunitarias or community leadership. Rules have been designed and revised to frame the electoral process and a substantial step in the direction of allocating village chiefs and Concilos Suco Community Council has been taken by a 2009 bill. However, the most salient feature of village politics is that these institutions remain outside of the reach of the state, being merely recognized as organs of self-rule destined to accomplish customary functions. In this light, it is not surprising that no allocation of state funds has been made on a regular basis, only grants decided at the higher levels being at the disposal of local leaders for small investments. However, according to Collier and Levetsky, Timor-Leste has generally met the benchmark of being considered democracy. According to Kingsbury and Mealy, voter turnout in Timor-Leste has been high. So what this means is that despite having to travel in often difficult circumstances, including trekking several kilometers of mountainous terrain, Timor-Leste's citizens continue to embrace enthusiastically the voting process. In both 2007 and 2012, there were celebrations prior to voting, along with early attendance at polling stations, voters wearing their best clothes, and celebrating again after voting. This all implies more than just the drudgery of being compelled to vote, but rather a deep acceptance of the process that, in Timorese or traditional Timorese belief system, has begun to look as though it has become lulic or sacred. According to Kingsbury in Politics in Contemporary Southeast Asia, after a faltering start, Timor-Leste's people have fully embraced the electoral process regarding and celebrating elections as a genuine process of participatory politics. And, as what D. Palma and Lins and Stepan said, it is this commitment and internalization of the value of electoral process that stands as a powerful indicator of the extent to which, at least, the electoral element of democracy has become institutionalized as the only game in town. With this, Timor-Leste scored highest among Southeast Asian countries on Democracy Index, with 7.16 following its independence from Indonesia in 2002. However, in compiling a Democracy Index, the Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy in Southeast Asia noted that the quality of democracy in Southeast Asia differed widely. No Southeast Asian country was, by this assessment, able to score at least 8 of 10 to be identified as full democracy. Thus, despite Timor-Leste's impressive political participation, it remains, however, a flawed democracy. In conclusion, Timor-Leste's path to independence has been difficult, and the United Nations, along with other external actors, played a major role in the country's history before and even after its independence. Moreover, 
the still young state has made remarkable political gains over a relatively short period. But while Timor-Leste has institutionalized key democratic criteria, those political gains have been based on vulnerable economic and institutional foundations, which means they remain susceptible to reversal. Furthermore, Timor-Leste's people and its political leaders appeared deeply committed to democratic process and attempting to achieve relatively high levels of transparency and accountability. Timor-Leste is still finding its way along a difficult post-independence path, and many problems and challenges remains to confront the young and fragile state.